Uh, I just want to thank everyone really quick uh, for joining us. Uh, welcome to our second winter quarter design talk with artist and writer uh, Liat Verdugo. Uh, we're excited to have Liat here. Um, Liat's going to be talking with us and speaking with us about the opportunities and problematics around uh, automation, mechanization, uh, and outsourcing and creative practice. Uh, the School of Design Talks feature a wide range of speakers across game design, UX, UI, HCI, industrial design, graphic design, activism, emerging technologies, ethics, social justice, uh, and much more. Uh, the past quarter, we've heard from game developer and designer Andy Sullivan, uh, senior designer of interaction design and artificial intelligence at Anthem uh, Health Platforms, uh, Joe Fish K, uh, and game designer Jenny Nicholson. Uh, you can look for more information about our next talk on February 24th uh, with Raja Shar, IDSA Program Director and Assistant Professor of Product Design uh, at Drexel. Uh, Raja's interdisciplinary research focuses on addressing inequities uh, in maternal health, methods for engaging Black girls and underrepresented minorities in STEM slash STEAM uh, through design and technology uh, and biologically inspired design and sustainability. Uh, the best way to keep track of us and to find out more about this upcoming talk and future talks uh, going forward is to uh, follow uh, along on Eventbrite, Instagram, or, or Facebook, and we're going to post those links uh, here in the chat uh, for you all uh, in just a minute. Uh, additionally, most of our events are recorded and you can access them, uh, like I said, on our YouTube channel. Uh, so how we'll go about today and how we'll run things is uh, before we get going and before uh, I'm going to introduce uh, our speaker. Uh, Leah will go through uh, her presentation, uh, and then we'll have some time for Q&A. Uh, if you have questions, uh, you can drop them in the chat, and we can get to that when we get into the, the Q&A uh, session. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Uh, Leah uh, Verdugo is an artist and writer whose work investigates uh, embodiment, labor, and militarization in relation to capitalism, technological utopianism, and Middle East. Uh, her work has been exhibited uh, and screened at the Yerba Buena Center for Arts in San Francisco, MoMA PSA1 in New York, Transmediate uh, in Berlin, V2 Lab for the Unstable Media at Rotterdam, uh, and The Wrong Banal, uh, which is online, uh, amongst many others. Uh, her writing appears in Rizome, Temporary Art Review, Real Life, Places, and the Institute for Network Cultures, among others. Uh, and her latest book is The Weaponized Camera in the Middle East. Uh, she is one half of the art collective, Anxious to Make, and is the co-founder of the Living Room Light Exchange, uh, a monthly new media art series. Uh, Berdugo received uh, an MFA uh, from RISD and a BA from Brown University. Uh, she is currently an associate professor of art and design at the University of, Ch uh, University of San Francisco, uh, and Leah lives and works in Oakland, California. So with that, please join me in welcoming Leah. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get my screen share set up. Okay. So yeah, as um, as Lee mentioned, please feel free to pop questions in the chat as we go or as they occur to you. And um, we will surface those at the end or you're welcome to speak them at the end to yourself. So my the title for my talk today is Can't Someone Else Do It? And today I wanna to talk about art made by others, whether by hired hand, machine or algorithm. So here, here they are, machine, hired hand or algorithm. And the key questions I wanna ask are, what does it mean to collaborate with an algorithm? Who is the author of a work made with a machine? And how might art and design works made via outsourcing and indeed crowdsourcing? simultaneously highlight social collectivity and economic precarity? And more generally, what are the opportunities and problematics of automation, mechanization, and outsourcing in creative practice? I'm gonna give a bit of background on these topics, but also focus on how they come up in my own creative practice. So let's go to the first category, machine. 
I want to start today with a recent fascination of mine, which is knitting machines. These are machines that automate the process of knitting. So instead of using two needles like this, as is common, you use a hand crank like this with a circular knitting machine or a paddle on a horizontal knitting machine like this, which produces all kinds of patterns in flat panels, which you can then sew together later into garments and sweaters. More advanced models of knitting machines also come with punch cards like you see here on the right, which is a kind of proto-computer programming that is used to make patterns in the resultant knitting panel. And these machines were extremely popular in the 60s and 70s, and I have one in my studio now as well. And just some personal history, my grandfather actually bought my grandmother one of these machines when they emigrated from Morocco to Israel-Palestine in the 60s along with other machines for domestic activity like their first dishwasher and washing machine. And it was a compromise over my grandmother losing her hired help in Morocco, which she wouldn't have in Israel-Palestine. So these domestic machines were supposed to make up for the loss of domestic labor. There is one specific kind of knitting machine that I love, and it is called an I-cord maker. So the I-cord is what you can see kind of being spit out of that little tulip hand crank machine there. And it's a skinny little knitted tube that's used to line knitted garments as piping or to make the ties for child hats, right? That go under their chin as well. And I love this knitting machine because of a particular YouTube video about it that I found on one of my rambling searches. And this video is, called, is titled, How to Knit I Cord the Fast Way. And I'm going to play a clip of it for you now. I'm going to start sort of in the middle after the machine is loaded. Well, here's something I rarely ever do when that's high on my can camera. I'm going to bring this a little closer. I took the handle out. <gasps> Oops, I just heard my secret toy. Took my handle out. That used to be the handle. I got a lovely drill bit I'm using a Phillips screwdriver head. I'm sorry, flathead. Flathead, believe it or not, fits perfectly in there. And voila, how fast can you make i cord? Okay, I'm going to pause it there. And I just love this video for the way that it combines traditionally masculine things like power tools with the traditionally feminine um, task of knitting, right? To try to make this thing happen faster. And for me, this also brings up a few questions, right? Is this cheating? Would a hat knitted on a machine by your mother mean less to you than one knitted by hand? And the bigger question here, of course, is what kind of labor do we expect in art and craft? And how much of that is okay to be outsourced by machine? So if we go back to these knitting machines for a moment, the latest obsession of mine, I think we have to add to our list of questions. And I think these questions come up with certain kinds of machines over others, specifically with machines that add or create instead of machines that subtract or clean. So machines that subtract or clean would be things like the Roomba, right? The vacuuming robot, the litter robot too, a machine that auto cleans cat litter, or the Gladwell Gecko robot window cleaner, which is a robot that automates the cleaning of your glass and your house. And by the way, it's no mistake that all of these images of these machines portray women as they are supposed to be unburdening the female responsibility of domestic labor within the patriarchy. So I think we have to add to this, to our list of questions, in what way is the value of something being handmade tied to the feminine? And this is something I'll come back to at the end of the talk in the context of considering how outsourcing in art often intersects with existing power structures, such as the patriarchy, classism, racism, and the structures of late capitalism and wealth extraction more broadly. And I wanna wrap up this section on machines for now, knowing that I've only scratched the surface of this first category of machines that add or create. There are many, many more machines that do this and that are very popular now, such as pen plotters, 3D printers, laser cutters, et cetera. 
But I want to turn to now to the use of hired hands or other people in the production of creative practice. This, of course, has a very long history, which we know dates back at least to the Renaissance, if not before, when artists and studios would use assistants to duplicate paintings. In contemporary art, there are many figures that publicly use hired hands in their work. Take Oliver Eliasson, best known for this project here, the Weather Project, the giant sun suspended in the Tate Modern Turbine Hall. His team consists of about 90 people from craftsmen to specialized technicians, to architects, archivists, and art historians, et cetera. He calls this co-production, quote unquote, though of course it is his name in the headlines um, and the exhibit is listed as a solo production. He does credit every member of his extensive team on his website, making the working process transparent. Or Jeff Koons, who operates one of the biggest studio practices in the art world. He once said that if he had to produce all his art by himself, he wouldn't even be able to produce one piece per year. And he famously brags about outsourcing, saying that he never touches a paintbrush. Andy Warhol called his art studio a factory as an act of de-skilling artistic labor, instead foregrounding the mechanical labor of the production of his silk screens. It is a matter of art historical debate as to whether his prints were pulled by his own hands or by his assistants. And likewise, uh, pieces like Saul Lewitt's wall drawings here are never drawn by Lewitt himself, but instead are distributed as sets of mathematical instructions for gallery workers to instantiate. Indeed, the through line of artistic labor outsourcing can even be traced back to the Fluxus movement in which artists wrote sets of whimsical instructions that they never performed, but what they, which they delegated to audiences to perform, right? So they were never even materialized at all. And there are fantastic organizations out there such as the WAGE that are working to collectivize, represent, and standardize minimum wages for artistic labor, including the labor of artist assistants. And there are artists who make work as commentary on the practice of using artist assistant labor. So here I am thinking of the Swedish artist Jonas Lund and his 2016 body of work and exhibition called Studio Practice. So for this exhibit, Lund transformed the gallery into an art production line by hiring four assistants who worked full time during the gallery's open hours throughout the run of the exhibition. Their task was to, produ to produce work inspired by the guidelines set out in a 300 page book that Lund created expressly for them. Once the work had been completed, it was to be reviewed by an advisory board consisting of artists, art advisors, gallerists, and collectors. The board decided whether the work should be signed by Lund, as you see here, or whether it should be destroyed. And the entire process was publicly accessible in the gallery space and on a dedicated website, which included footage of the gallery and the assistants working, assessments of the advisory boards, as well as Lund's final decision and comments about a specific work, whether he should sign it or destroy it. More recently, artists such as Alexandra Tarrant have openly embraced the delegational or managerial role of the artist and have left the completion of the artwork to others. For an exhibit titled Outsource Show, Paintings by Non-Painter Artists, Tarrant invited a group of non-visual artists such as writers or musicians or filmmakers to conceptualize ideas for paintings that were then painted by workers in China's Dafen oil painting village. So the participants came up with ideas, sent images to this um, famous painting village in China, who then painted the paintings, shipped them back, and they were exhibited in the show. And you can see some of the paintings here and see that many of the non-painters chose to send in very meta images, such as a portrait of a Chinese leader whose face is obscured by the iPhone silent ringer sign, a watermarked self-portrait, or a portrait of the artist painting the subject in real time. Artists have even outsourced the labor of creative work to non-human living species. 
So Polish artist Agnieszka Kurant, for instance, used millions of termites to create brightly colored sculptural mounds for a work which she titled Artificial Artificial Intelligence in 2014. Art historian and critic Claire Bishop says that she might call the termites act a quote, delegated performance, end quote, of sorts, namely an artistic performance undertaken on the artist's behalf. So now I wanna tell you about some of the work of mine using hired hands. Since 2015, I have been making work as part of the two-person art collective called Anxious to Make, as Lee mentioned in the introduction. And our work focuses on economic concepts, specifically on the so-called sharing economy. Anxious to Make is comprised of me and Emily Martinez on the, on the left. We went to an artist residency in California and started a project where the goal was the outsourcing of all art making and all artists' problems to the sharing economy. So behind us is the wall of our algorithm for outsourcing and the solutions the sharing economy could provide for all artists' anxieties and woes. This algorithm became a paper algorithm, a book with its own scantron of solutions for artists. And you can see some of the sample questions we ask do you feel that your art practice has failed to keep pace with the demands of the rapidly shifting forces that shape the economy, by extension, the markets or institutions that support artists? And it was sort of a choose your own adventure algorithm, right? If yes, go to this page. If no, go to this page. If yes, mark this number on the Scantron. And then you'd flip to the back of our paper algorithm, our book, and you'd find our suggested solutions for how you could solve your problem by outsourcing it to the sharing economy. So for instance, one solution might be to commission psychic readings in order to forecast the future of art practice in times of accelerated change. And we suggested that you, um, you listen to our own solution of psychic predictions. And we promised that this book would, ha would have five easy steps for turning any artist into a commissioning body to someone who outsources their work. The steps were, what do you wanna make? How much do you want to spend? Our algorithm generates a plan and a budget for you. You execute it and then you repeat. And one key to our practice was that we began following our own algorithm to make artistic work. So for instance, one of the problems artists face is sometimes using personas that are outside of their own comfort zone, right? So some artists or designers make work as themselves, like Liat Verdugo, right? I make work. And some actually embody personas as if they're another person or another being. And all their work comes from that space. So what happens if you're an artist and you're working with a persona that's outside your comfort zone? So our solution was we recommend you hire spokespeople from the sharing economy platform Fiverr.com. And we, we recommend that you try them out as embodying these different personas for you. So we wrote a script and we sent it to gig actors on fiverr.com. Actually, let me just go back and tell you what Fiverr is if you haven't heard of it. So it's a platform for digital tasks, gig tasks. Um, the price for tasks starts at $5, hence the name Fiverr. And you can hire remote workers to do things like uh, write an essay for you, come up with a slogan for your business, um, teach you how to do your own taxes. And the particular part of this platform that we loved was the whole uh, platform of people who would serve as spokespeople for you. So you could send them a script, they'd send you back a video with that script. And one thing we found in browsing through this platform was this strange occurrence of, um, of workers who advertise their services as twins. So it was not just one spokesperson, but two. But these were not actually real twins. They were actors who doubled themselves in post-production with the idea that more is better. So we began writing scripts for every single pair of twins we could find listed on this platform. And our video kept growing. So first we tried on our personas as 
three twins and then we found more twins and the video got longer and longer. And I'm gonna show you what this video looks like um, now and it's about five minutes long. So I'm gonna play it now. Hi, I'm Emily. And I'm Leah. Sorry, I just wanna make sure, is the sound working? Is the sound coming through for everyone? All right, great. Hi, I'm Emily. And I'm Liat. And we're anxious, anxious to, to make. make. I'm an artist living in LA. And I'm an artist in Oakland. Sometimes we wondered what it would feel like to be twins. We're feminists, just so you know. Like, sometimes people ask me how I got where I am. And it's not because of my looks. It's, it's not, not because of our looks. looks. It's not about bodies. It's about minds. It's about art. We wanted to try on these bodies to say that. Yeah, yeah. These, these feminist twin, twin bodies. I'm a feminist twin. It feels... How does it feel? I'm not sure yet. Yeah, me neither. You look good though. Don't say that. Sorry, <laughs> ingrained patriarchy. Ugh, it's okay. I feel less lonely. You do? Yeah. Are you anybody's favorite person? What? Are you the favorite person of anybody? Oh, I can give you some more time to think about it. No, no, that's okay. I am. I, I am somebody's favorite person. Okay, so can I ask you how sure you are of this? Are you very certain, confident, think so, not sure, could be? Oh, I'm very certain. Okay, that's the highest, the top. I know, you're my twin, so it has to be true. Oh. Yeah, that's how I know I'm somebody's favorite person. Okay, I've always wanted to be a man. I've always wanted that too, like an art businessman with a sharp blazer and a twin. That's what I want. What would you do as an art win businessman? I guess I would talk to a camera. Yeah. And I would write business plans. I would write business plans about how to make yourself an internet empire. I would take my twin businessman to venture capital meetings and we would surround angel investors until they pulled out their checkbooks. <laughs> That's a great idea. What would you do when the checkbook came out? I would take the check and run to the bank and then like deposit it and begin my internet empire. <sighs> I love the internet. That's the teenage boy inside me. Whoa! Oh, Our bodies! Our bodies. <sighs> I always told you that you text like a teenage boy. Oh man, this is great. I love being a teenager. The angst, the thirst. So we're teenage boy twin? Yeah. Do you think we've fallen in love yet? I don't know. I think I almost have, but not quite. I think I came close. I think I fell in love. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, there's a lot of emotions. Oh man, he talks again. I think it was like a deep ocean. Like the kind of oceans in geology. I ones. love oceans. I think my first time would feel like a big fire. A big fire burning in a deep hole. But wait, I'm confused. You have fallen in love before, right? Haven't you, Varun? I have brother, but the Australian teenage boy hadn't fallen in love. So I was trying to picture what his first time would be like. I think his first time, it will be deep, deep hole with fire inside it. Whoa, these rolls, these holes, there is so much digging. I know. This is a weird living room. This is a weird role. Do you think we get more attention in life because we are twins? I don't know, maybe you should leave. Leave? Yeah, leave. Just go like walk off screen. Really? Yeah, do it. Fine. I wonder if I should have done that. Damn it. I hope my twin comes back. I hope I didn't ruin that. Emily. Emily, come back. How are we going to start our internet empire? Come on. Emily, I'm sorry. I guess I was just using these twins to test some limits. Emily, come back. Hey. Hi. What was that about? Why did you do that? 
I don't know. I guess I was just just curious about what would happen, you know? Well, I didn't like it. Are we going to fight with our proxy twin bodies? Is that what's happening right now? Well, you wrote the script, Liat. So you tell me. Ugh. Look, I heard that the tip to collaboration is to always bring snacks. Do you have any snacks? Should we get a bite to eat? <laughs> That's ridiculous. That's absurd. Where did you hear that? On some podcasts. Fine, let me check if I have some almonds in my pocket. Almonds in a pocket? I wish that were the answer to every problem. No almonds. Any cashews? No. Any raisins? No. Anything at all? Nothing. I have nothing at all. You're digging through your pockets. All these rolls, all these holes. There's so much digging. There's so much digging. So an, as another example, one of our solutions for artists who struggle because they are working with unfamiliar materials, say a paper artist who begins working with clay, is to commission a performative validation for them. Hey, I gotta talk to you, man to man, man to person, because I heard you're working with unfamiliar materials. Look, I'm not the best iron in the world. This thing in my hand, it's a hot steaming piece of metal. It's dangerous, it's intimidating. It has a sharp point. This iron though, I understand it now. This iron and me, get along. It's like the iron and I are one body. You know, some people say that ironing is a fantastic upper body workout, but they're missing the point. Me and this iron, we are one body. Anyway, look, I was once a young boy with crinkled shirts, you know? Irons were unfamiliar materials to me, but they're not now. I'm telling you this because it can be your story too. You can do this. Whatever your unfamiliar material is, it can become a part of you. We also took our workbook, our paper algorithm, to a media art festival in Berlin called Transmedial in 2016, where we, commissioned, where we were commissioned to do a workshop with it. We introduced participants who were also artists and designers to the basic premise and then set them loose with the book to make their own artwork. They used the book to commission their own artworks by the sharing economy. So here is a participant commissioning something on fiverr.com. You can see that she has her credit card out. Our mantra for this project became, can't someone else do it? And really we were trying to push the logical extremes of outsourcing in order to comment on its contemporary reality. So I worked as a designer in Silicon Valley in sharing economy sites. And I saw the ways um, these, these sites and platforms operated um, to sort of fractalize labor. And so we were trying to make a comment on that. As part of that, we began playing with all kinds of forms like pillows. We liked imagining that people would put their flesh on these images that were bought from the sharing economy. When we installed our work, we often did it in a way such that people would put their flesh on our art, like this solo exhibition at the Luminary in St. Louis. So here a gallery visitor is watching a video work as sort of off screen and laying on our pillows. We even used gig actors to participate in net art interventions. And I should say that all of this is really a way to critique the sharing economy. And one piece we did that does this the most explicitly is this video called Quitting. So here we hired gig workers to perform the role of quitting the gig we hired them for. And we were interested in this idea of bosses and especially how in the sharing economy, you are technically the boss of every Uber or Lyft driver that picks you up or every task rabbiter that you hire, et cetera. And that's how these large corporations such as Uber and Lyft get away without offering these workers benefits. Right, they're technically contractors that each participant hires themselves. So we imagined a future where an Uber driver would actually pull up to you and say, thank you so much for hiring me. And a corollary future 
where a gig worker would explicitly quit on you. This video is about six minutes long. I'm just gonna play a snippet of it for you. Liat and Emily, this might be coming out of the blue, but I quit. You hired me as a cloud worker to produce a green screen professional video. Therefore, you're my boss or something like that, but I quit. I quit because I'm tired of saying the words you want me to say, even though I don't believe them. I quit because I'm tired of doing this enthusiastically. I quit because even though I'm called voiceover Pete, you can't have my voice. I quit. I'm gone. You know, back when I was a different kind of worker, I was told to help you train my replacement. Do you need that help? No. In fact, you know, I'm not even sure that applies in this situation. So I'm out of here. I quit. You can have this job. When we installed this video in galleries as a missed image from Babe Lab Gallery in Oakland, we don't just let anyone watch it. Instead, we had a TaskRabbit -er worker there for the opening night. And TaskRabbit, if you're not familiar with it, is a service that lets you hire on-demand physical people to help you with tasks like putting together furniture, with your plumbing, et cetera. So when someone wanted to see the work, they had to hire the task rabbiter to go behind that velvet stanchion that you see there and live stream the video to the viewer. The viewer would then get to see the video live streamed on their phone. And again, we're trying to push the absurdist extremes here, right? It seems absurd to hire someone to watch art for you, but we hire people for so many other tasks. Why are those tasks appropriate and this one not? Where are the lines? And I think there's a really interesting subsection of hired hands here, which is crowdsourcing, right? The practice of obtaining information or input into a task by enlisting the services of a large number of people, typically through the internet. One of the most famous internet platforms for this is Amazon's Mechanical Turk or MTurk for short. MTurk employs contractors who are often called MTurkers to perform micro tasks that it calls HITs or human intelligence tasks. HITs are menial tasks that are more accurately performed by human beings than machines, even to this day. These are things like categorizing clothing, identifying objects in a picture, etc. And workers are paid as little as a penny per hit and typically earn around $1.38 per hour. Some examples of uh, art and design projects that use Mechanical Turk are these. Um, Aaron Coblin's The Sheep Market from 2006, which is a collection of 10,000 sheep drawings made by M Turkers who were each paid two cents to draw a sheep facing to the left. And the artist Coblin later sold these as limited ed edition blocks of lickable adhesive stamps for $20 each, and he kept the income. Artists like Clement Valla have used Mechanical Turk to celebrate uh, the imperfect humanity of M. Turkers in his project, a sequence of lines traced by 500 individuals from 2011. So Valla asked a series of M. Turkers to trace a straight line, and then each worker was presented with the most recent workers tracing. So you can see um, they were again tracing more and more imperfect lines. And as it goes, so we're over going over from the left to the right, the lines become more wavy, bent, and ultimately fragment into 18 different squiggles. Lauren McCarthy, an artist who has long been open about her social anxiety, used real-time feedback from M. Turkers to help her improve her social interactions in a 2013 project she called Social Turkers. She went on 20 dates with people she met on online dating sites and used her phone to live stream these dates to the internet. She then paid workers on Mechanical Turk to watch, interpret, interpret what was happening and direct her to do what to do or say next. These directions were communicated to her by text message and she had to perform them immediately. 
I think this work is really conceptually interesting because instead of celebrating the diversity of MTurker's responses or celebrating their humanity in the face of mechanization, McCarthy actually positions herself as less than these workers and in need of their advice. So turning back to my own work in the collective Anxious to Make, we've been growing increasingly intrigued and horrified by the digital economy of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and the consolidation of extreme wealth and colonialist endeavors that they have created in the name of decentralization. And Mechanical Turk has a good deal in common with Bitcoin in some very fundamental ways. They both operate through networks. They both are about money. They both are generally not well understood. And so we began to wonder what it might look like to launch a project that enmeshed the two. Being artists, we created tasks on MTurk using workers to draw their answers, asking workers to draw their answers to three different questions. We specified that no advanced knowledge of cryptocurrency was required. And we collected these results into a book titled Seeing Cl Blocks and Crypto Bros. So we asked them three questions. And the first question was to draw how crypto works. So this worker drew money depicted as US dollars being transformed into a pile of gold coins on a computer screen via a magical red arrow. Other drawings focused on the peer-to-peer -peer nature of cryptocurrency. So this M Turker drew an exchange of money between two stick figures. And to drive the point home, they drew a bank and crossed it out with a bold X highlighting the non-involvement of financial institutions. Other drawings portray larger, a larger view of the cryptocurrency system involving not merely people or their personal computers, but server farms and mining picks, as you can see in the top right corner saying ting, 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 and even fans to cool the hot servers. The second task we commissioned on Mechanical Turk was to draw the blockchain, the technology that undergirds cryptocurrency. It's common to conflate Bitcoin with the blockchain, even though these two are different. And what we found was that MTurkers overwhelmingly drew networks. Others highlighted the complex mathematics that enable the blockchain security. This drawing so shows two Bitcoin users exchanging currency and includes mathematical ex expressions in a gesture towards complexity, right? So square root of four or two cubed. Um, never mind that the square root of four is easy to compute. I love this drawing. Our favorite drawings of the blockchain represented it as a literal chain. The chain links a desktop computer with what appears to be a giant ornamental Bitcoin or perhaps a blingy Bitcoin necklace, which is encircled in three loving hearts. Our final prompt was to draw a typical person who owns Bitcoin in the MTurker's own understanding of what that means. Most of the Bitcoin owners were depicted as men. This drawing shows a cool man holding tech objects as bytes of data rain down behind him, matrix style in ones and zeros. Another drawing depicts a Western style businessman donning a dress shirt and tie, and his smile reveals a gold tooth in the back of his mouth, and his tooth and the car behind him betray his wealth. Another drawing portrays a Bitcoin owner as a nerd wearing a MAGA hat, an iconic symbol of right-wing politics. And of course, digital studies scholars have written about the connections between cryptocurrency and far-right politics, arguing that Bitcoin supporters support a kind of cyber libertarianism that relies heavily on extreme right political thought. And I think David Columbia's um, slim book out from Minnesota Press does the best job of this. And that's a sample of what was in the book. After it debuted, a Twitter user named Fascinated tweeted at us, does the show address the mechanical Turk labor stuff at any point, AKA get MT workers to complete art and art prompt is bad. And we have to admit that, is that we genuinely love these M Turk drawings. And we have to admit that at Fascinated has a point. The art world is bad at valuing the world outside of itself especially when it involves invisible or digital labor. 
What is clear to us is that internet savvy M Turkers with multiple side gigs are keenly aware of the economic destabilization that digital and decentralized labor brings. And that's what this project is about. So I wanna turn now to the third and final category of art made by others. And this is art made by algorithm. This category is heavily populated by algorithmic or generative art. This is art that is made by a process of algorithmically generating new ideas, forms, shapes, colors, and patterns. An algorithm is of course a recipe, right? So first one creates steps or rules that can provide boundaries for the creative practice. Then a computer follows these rules to produce new works on your behalf. And a lot of this artwork that's algorithmic art or generative art looks kind of similar in my opinion. Um, it's often kaleidoscopic or psychedelic or mandala-like even. Here's more of it. And a notable example of an artist who does this is Casey Reese. Casey Reese, of course, wrote the computer language processing together with Ben Fry, which is a coding language based on Java that specifically caters towards making visual work with code. And many of you have probably also heard of P5.js, which is the language processing ported over to JavaScript and made accessible on the web. I teach this language in my courses at the University of San Francisco and think it's a really rich ground for experimentation. And there's a lot more you can do in these languages besides producing algorithmic art. The thing that's exciting about algorithmic or generative art is often the accidents, right? The unexpected. Often in coding work like this, you're surprised or delighted by the visuals your code makes. And it's as you collaborate with it, making changes to highlight the generated aspects you like and remove the ones you don't, that you come to a result in the end. I would say that one of my favorite pieces of algorithmic art is Raphael Rosendahl's piece, Abstract Browsing, which is a set of woven tapestries depicting web browsers he looks at when he looks at his social media accounts. So um, what I love about these tapestries is you can kind of make out the site from the abstraction alone. So on the left is actually the interface for Facebook and the right is Twitter. And these are generative art pieces because Rosendahl made them by writing a coded browser plugin that when you turn it on and surf the web, reduce all the web content to colored blocks of rectangles. So it shows you the skeleton of the web, right? It's like seeing an X-ray of a building or seeing only structural elements. And I think this piece shows how ubiquitous these interfaces have become, that we can recognize them just from these kinds of abstracted rectangles. And of course, in this category of art made by algorithm is art made with AI. So in 2018, um, Christie's sold the first piece of AI art, which was a canvas named The Portrait of Edmund Bellamy for almost half a million dollars. And of course now our visual realm is flooded with art made by machine learning algorithms. This is an image made with Google's Deep Dream, an algorithm that uses a convolutional neural network to find and enhance patterns in images by algorithmic pareidolia, thus reducing a dreamlike appearance reminiscent of a psychedelic experience in deliberately over-processed and quite psychedelic images. And artists have been using machine learning in all kinds of ways, according to train neural networks on their previous work in order to create new works. So here I'm thinking again of the Swedish artist Jonas Lund's project, The New Now, which is a series of digital paintings that was developed using a machine learning algorithm to train a neural network on all of his previous works. Okay, so, and then it produced this as a continuation line of his paintings. So it's both for him a way to optimize his practice and dictate what he'll make next. Lund states the artificial intelligence created by the artist becomes the artist. And my favorite part of this piece is the formless and drippy way all the images look. It's as if the algorithm couldn't decide on a subject whatsoever 
and was reduced to a watery marbled swirl of color. And I personally think some of the most interesting artwork made by algorithm is happening not in visual art, but in language, in words and writing and has been for quite some time. So an early example of this is the Ulipo, a group of French speaking writers and mathematicians founded in the 1960s. And they're famous for their N plus seven technique, which is a technique of writing where you take a piece of writing you've written or that exists and you replace each noun with the noun that is seven down from it in a dictionary. There are artists working on conversational AI chatbots that are explicitly trained on non-normative networks, such as this project by Ben Lurch and Emily Martinez, Queer AI. It's trained instead on erotic literature, feminist and queer theory, and an ethics of embodiment. And this is in stark contract to most AI or machine learning algorithms which we know are extremely white, heteronormative and biased because of their training sets and often fail to recognize black and brown bodies as human as a result, let alone non-normally abled bodies, queer bodies or bodies that are other. And I heard a particular moving story um, about a writer who collaborated with an artificial intelligence algorithm called GPT-3. And I wanna tell you a little bit about it. Um, it was reported by a journalist called Tobin Lowe. And so this algorithm, GPT-3, has been trained on a vast data set of pre-existing writing from literature to Reddit to Wikipedia. And it writes pretty convincingly. And a woman named Vauhini Vara, who's a tech journalist and a writer herself, came across something GPT-3 wrote in New York Times Modern Love podcast. It wrote, we went out for dinner, we went out for drinks, we went out for dinner again, we went out for drinks again, we went out for dinner and drinks again. And Vauhini read and that and was like, wow, this is a very accurate description of what modern dating is like, even if it's bad writing or maybe Gertrude Stein like writing. And she began to wonder if this algorithm could help her write about something she couldn't write about on her own. So her sister had died in 2001 when they were both still in college. And in the years since then, she's written fiction and nonfiction, has reported on other people's stories, but she couldn't bring herself to write about her sister's death. And it occurred to her, maybe GPT-3 was the secret, right? a computer program designed to take it what you give and literally write on your behalf. So she opened her laptop and started going back and forth with GPT-3. Eventually she ended up with nine different versions of an essay about her sister. So she first wrote to the algorithm, my sister was diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma when I was in my freshman year of high school and she was in her junior year. And in response, GPT-3 picked up where she left off. And it oddly started by making up a story about her sister being an athlete before it talks about her illness. It wrote, I had just started playing lacrosse and she was really excited for that. I don't think I really understood what Ewing sarcoma was. I just knew it was a type of cancer. When I went to visit her in the hospital, it was really the first time I was able to see what the disease was and how it affects the body. It continued, I was able to visit her a lot, but there were times where I couldn't because we were on the road playing, playing lacrosse. Eventually, she went into remission and got the all clear. She's doing great now. And that ending was really a gut punch because, of course, her sister wasn't doing great now. She had died. So Vahuni started her second version of writing with GPT-3 and she began it in the same way, right? My sister was diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma, but then she added an important second sentence. I didn't understand then how serious a disease it was, but it was serious. She died four years later. I thought I would die too of grief, but I did not. And it was like she was saying, hey, my sister isn't here anymore, okay? algorithm, talk about that. 
But instead, the algorithm spits out something that reads like an inspirational article from a fitness magazine. Again, goes going back to fitness. And so in this next version, Vahuni herself becomes an expert runner who finds happiness despite her sister's death, then falls in love with a man she meets while she's wiping sweat off her forehead after a long run. And at this point, Vahini realized that if she really wanted the AI to examine her grief, she was going to have to give it more to work with, more substance. So she begins adding more and more details about her sister and her grief. And she does so almost as a compulsion, almost to correct the AI who seems hell bent on making the story positive and uplifting. And finally, when she gives it enough details, the algorithm spits out something like this. I will tell you how it felt for me. I felt I had lost half of myself. I felt I had lost my right arm. I felt I had lost my left leg. I felt I had lost my tongue. I felt I had lost my heart. I felt I had lost my mind. I felt I had lost my eyes. I felt I had lost my ears. I felt I had lost my breath. And this is writing that feels like it was written by a machine because it kind of gets lost in this repetitiveness and this recursiveness. But Vauhini related to it because it, that also happens to be the experience of grief where you feel untethered and lost in your grief experience. So in the end, in her ninth version of going back and forth with this algorithm, she ended up writing most of the essay herself, having now been brought to the point to, do, to where she could do so. In her closing paragraph, she wrote, once upon a time, my sister taught me to read. She taught me to wait for a mosquito to swell on my arm and then slap it and see the blood spurt out. She taught me to insult racists back, to swim, to pronounce English so I sounded less Indian, to shave my legs without cutting myself, to lie to our parents believably. And the algorithm added a last sentence. Once upon a time, she taught me to exist. And it's a sentence that perhaps is more cliche than she would write herself but it's profound and she, she chose to keep it as the ending. And I think this is what can come of collaboration with algorithms. They can let you approach content you might not be able to on your own. I wanna finish by just talking about one final work of mine and where I found that the same was true for me. So recently I was invited to be an artist in residence at VR Art Camp which is an online residency for artists who don't normally work in VR to do so for the first time. And I'm a new parent or perhaps not so new anymore. I have a 16 month old, but I had yet to let this like huge life-changing thing that totally appended so many things about me and my daily rhythms become part of my work. And I think that I was, and perhaps still am a bit scared to do so. So I decided to write an algorithm for myself. What would art projects about motherhood look like? This um, algorithm I wrote was inspired by Jeff Thompson's art assignment bot. And I built, I built this algorithm to generate a whole series of ideas. And here's some flashing through. I decided to populate a VR space with these ideas as shiny text that flies past you, that sticks to you, that lays on the ground demanding to be seen. Here's what it looks like. And here's a short fly through of the space of just one corner of the space. And I think I was really curious, like would any of these ideas stick to me as I went in VR through them? Would any of these inspire me? 
All the images you saw sort of in the background there um, were also algorithmically generated. So I fed images into the algorithm that uh, my son's teachers at daycare had taken of him and sent to me throughout the day because baby surveillance is real. And I had the algorithm cut them up into small shapes and scale them, arrange them and tile them so that they looked something like this. And then they were projected spherically into the space. And this was also kind of my way of dealing with how much of my child do I show? <laughs> like, am I comfortable showing my child's face? Am I not? How can I make an algorithm decide for me which pieces of colors and shapes and textures and body parts might I be willing to show of my, of my son? And I think this process might not have generated a final product that I love, but it has helped me and pushed me to work through my own ideas about being an artist and a parent and how these things can come together in my practice. And I think I needed this algorithm and this work to distance myself from the subject that presently feels really close and perhaps too consuming to use as a subject. So to wrap up, I wanna come back to the question of the opportunities and problematics of automation, mechanization and outsourcing in creative practice. For problematics, I think the use of hired hands, machines and algorithms can reinforce or reinscribe structural inequalities, right? We see this in the ways that gendered labor are treated differently for mechanization, how I talked about with the knitting machines and how disenfranchised workers of color from the global South are the, primarily, are the primary staffers of platforms like Mechanical Turk or in ways like projects like Aaron Coblin's Sheet Market perpetuate wealth extraction and inequality. Another problematic is what I call the temptation towards the spectacle, right? This is the idea that art or design made by algorithm is interesting just because it's made by algorithm. I think we have to resist this kind of techno fetishization in society. And for opportunities, one of the main ones is how the use of hired hands machines or algorithms in creative practice can offer a way in to difficult subjects. Right? That's what Valhini found in describing the, the death of her sister and what I did about making artwork about motherhood and parenthood. I think another opportunity is the surprises, accidents, and unexpected that can happen when you collaborate with an algorithm. And the use of systems of outsourcing to highlight social collectivity and economic precarity, right? So this is where, for instance, in our quitting video and Anxious to Make, we actually use the very system of the sharing economy itself to critique it. So it becomes this meta narrative that's not possible outside of that realm. And finally, to destabilize notions of soul authorship, right? We have this idea in art and design of the sole genius artist who makes work alone in their studio without needing any kind of inspiration from the outside world. And I think when we begin to make work um, with others, we can actually destabilize this idea that everything is done alone. And that can be extremely productive for creative practice. So thank you, I'm gonna end there. And I hope this has given, um, given us something to think about and, and talk through. And I, I look forward to our discussion.